G'day, I'm Paul Bone, and I'd like to talk about Haskell. So, I uh, did this talk for the local Haskell user group here in Melbourne. I was in initially quite hesitant about it, and um, but it it was it received um, a fair amount of praise, and I'd also like to have a go at making a screencast, and this seemed like suitable material. So, so let's get started. So. Um, what happened was I was approached by one of the organizers, Lyndon, from the, Has from the uh, Haskell user group and um, basically he was looking for people to give talks and um, so he, um, he proposed the idea of a Haskell sucks talk and, um, and I, I accepted that but was like understandably nervous about approaching, coming into the Haskell user group and, and delivering this talk. So. But it, it all went well in the end. So, so the problem with the title Haskell Sucks and is um, anything sucks is not really useful. Um, a lot of things, like in, according to Theodore Sturgeon, 90% uh, of everything sucks. I prefer to say 90% of everything is mediocre because this is st statistically true. So, and what I've got to say about Haskell is specific. Um, which means it's um, it's more useful criticism. So um, I've also met uh, both Simon Peyton Jones and Simon Marlowe, and we got along quite well. And I, yeah, um, I I respect their work. I think they've done a great job. So um, so I don't want to take that away from them, regardless of whether I know them or not. But that's that's there for whatever that's worth. So and. Yeah, Haskell actually got a lot of things very right. Um, it's just, if anything, it's disappointing because it's not perfect. So, you know, like I said, Haskell is actually pretty damn good, but it has some specific critical problems. So that's what I'd prefer to talk about. So I'm not a Haskell expert. I have used Haskell, um, and I have worked in uh, pure declarative languages for quite a while. So I've mostly worked with Mercury. I've worked on Mercury and in Mercury. Um, I've part of that uh, work involved uh, working on ThreadScope, which is a visualization tool for parallel Haskell programs. Um, and it was written in Haskell. And for Mercury's purposes, we basically were able to um, make sure that our runtime system wrote out a, a file that the ThreadScope tool could use. It was fortunate that um, both the Mercury and GHC runtime systems were similar enough that that could mostly work. Um, I've also uh, tutored Haskell. So anyway, Haskell is very, very good. It's got my two favorite features. It's purely functional and it doesn't allow side effects. Um, and it's types and it's got uh, strong static types. So it's also got pretty good performance. Um, uh, plenty of library support and a community um, which comes with books and uh, other resources and um, it supports parallelism and concurrency which uh, I care about quite a bit. So my specific problems with Haskell are monads and lazy evaluation um, including how they interact but that's not covered here today. So let's get started on monads. We always hear this joke, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. So what's the problem? And it's often attributed, uh, attributed to Phil Wadler. Um, but uh, I did some looking around before I did that and um, the best I could find was um, um, a, a quote that seemed a little bit related but really wasn't trying to say what we imagine that quote to be saying, which um, comes from um, a textbook. So we think, but this is according to the internet, so it, I could still be wrong here. This joke is funny, and it gets repeated as a joke because, like all good jokes, there's some truth to it. The idea being that um, monads are this really uh, dense abstract mathematical concept that once you understand it it's quite simple but until then it just sounds like word salad and the joke is funny because that's true so and despite um, people struggling to learn them 
Um, a big problem with monads is that we struggle as, as a community uh, to explain them well. And there are some people working on that. Um, like, it's, there's, there's been some good uh, work on that and some not so good work. Um, so I, I don't mean to say that um, the people aren't working on that or that nothing's been done, because it has. Um, it's, it's, the problem is just not yet solved. So let's go back to what monads are. Um, we see these other tutorials. These are some of the uh, not so good work on explaining monads. We try and come up with metaphors and uh, say that monads are spacesuits, toxic waste, or um, burritos, which I believe was satirical. So, and uh, this is yeah part of the problem um, that there's this. Um, that there are all these monad tutorials uh, by all these people who do understand monads but um, they don't explain them well so um, um, I mean, there's to the point that the article about burritos makes fun of the others um, and I found this link uh, interesting to read so um, that was quite insightful so okay the third attempt at explaining what a monad is um, and um, I think all of these have been true, and this one is, is especially true. A monad is just a pair, is something that obeys these laws. Um, and this is fine, and it makes sense uh, if, if you already understand what a monad is. And it's it looks simple, so there's some elegance and some attraction there. But unless you understand monads, you can't understand this definition. It's not going to. It's not going to help you get it. Uh, neither are spacesuits or burritos. You need to understand what problems you're uh, trying to solve, and then uh, what's common between them. And that's why uh, Brent's article, the link on the previous slide, uh, was good because that's what it explained. Um, yeah. Then my other point that I'd like to make here is that once you do understand monads and understand um, uh, these things, uh, either these equations or, or the monoid uh, uh, Phil Wadler's uh, attributed quote, um, then it feels good because you've achieved something, you've learnt something, and that's a positive feeling that, uh, that you take in. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's... This is a problem because then you reward yourself for achieving the difficult thing when in fact the difficult thing shouldn't have been necessary to begin with. Uh, I can use many other languages without trying to understand uh, something as abstract as monads and, and my, life was, my life was fine before then. So why is it that I need monads now? Uh, and. Um, and then when I finally do get to understand them, I reward myself, and the cycle continues. Like cause now we still we have them in these languages, and uh, new programmers come up and are expected to learn them as well and go through the same thing. But maybe it's not any worse than learning recursion or pointers because those had the same uh, difficulty, the same uh, difficult learning curve. So. This is what we should actually be explaining, or part of it. Um, so I've just bagged out monads, basically. Uh, but they're actually good, and this is this is part of the problem. Um, uh, like Haskell itself, uh, it's got some critical problems, but there's a lot of good sides. So monads are extremely useful. Um, they're, they're great at uh, controlling side effects, handling errors, managing state. Um, all kinds of things. Uh, my favorite is non-deterministic search using the list monad. So um, that's just a neat trick. Um, but, and that, that's where monads interact with lazy evaluation uh, to, to, prefer, to, to provide non-deterministic search. Um, uh, let's look at some examples. Um, and by the way, I'm not trying to explain what monads are. I'm just trying to explain what the problems are. If I was actually trying to explain them, I'd have started completely differently. So this is this is addressing people who already know this stuff um, and explaining why it's a problem, rather than addressing people who don't know this stuff. So the simple example: 
um, IO. And it does that and it provides a sequence to your operations. Pretty simple. So we can do nice error handling. We can take the code above, um, which uh, has to do all this pattern matching to keep checking if uh, there's an error, and, um, and instead use the ether monad to save a lot of redundant code. So that saves uh, writing, but it also, and more importantly, saves reading so, and comprehension. Um, so, and, and that's a very good thing. Um, yep, and likewise, something that does something a little bit more different, it can read data from a binary stream. Um, okay, an example of the, uh, you see it's been a little while since I've read these slides, so, uh, but I, because it was back in June and now it's uh, November, so, um, yeah, here's something that, uh, that writes logging information. Um, this is an interesting example because it's one that can be combined with other monads using a monad transformer, and here's where we start hitting the real pain of monads. Um, so I, so earlier I had my gripe that they're difficult to learn. Um, here, uh, my my problem with monads is that they cannot be composed. Um, there are these things called monad transformers, but they do not actually solve the problem. They attempt to work around it, and in my opinion, not very well. So it's it's the best we've got as far as I know, um, but it is not a, a solution. So. Um, if you compare monads with linear types, you'll see that those do compose. So monad transformers. Um, yeah, here get and writer are combined um, to um, to read a, a binary stream and handle errors, and we have to put all this extra stuff, all this lifting and, and hoist generalize in our code to make this work. Now, hoist generalize, that was an interesting one. Um, I'd never seen this before. Um, this is a, uh, I think it was called a monad morphism. I don't know what that means, um, and I shouldn't have to know what that means. So, um, but that was the magic incantation to make this compile and run. So, uh, and that's, that's disappointing. Um, in any other system, I would be able to compose these much more easily. Well, one of the things that you can do is write new utility functions that combine, uh, say, lift with get word 16 big endian, uh, that first function on the second line, um, into one function uh, that you can then use over and over. And it cuts down on your boilerplate but it doesn't cut down on the effort required uh, comprehension-wise when you write the code. It possibly helps with reading. Again, that's a workaround and not a solution. One of the, um, one of the difficulties when you do combine monads is that now they form a stack. The one, uh, I believe it's the outermost one, uh, it gets to override the bind operator first. So uh, now it can be quite difficult to know what control flow is going on in your program um, when, you, when you have more than one monad, which monad is taking care of control flow. Um, yeah, to summarize monads, they're, they're an unfamiliar abstract concept, which means that they're hard to learn. Um, Despite being hard to learn, we're generally not very good at explaining them or teaching people. Um, so it shouldn't be necessary to learn them, um, and even though it is, we're bad at explaining it. Um, they are a barrier to Haskell adoption. When you meet somebody who has tried Haskell a couple of times, they'll often say, I got up to the M word, and then stopped. And they might have done that two or three times, uh, had two or three attempts at learning Haskell. And what if they, I mean, there would be a lot uh, more people using Haskell if, um, if that wasn't a barrier, uh, but it is. They don't compose, so even if you do understand them, they're still a struggle to use. Um, uh, monad transformers don't solve composition. Um, and um, 
and they can hide uh, relevant details such as what happens with control flow. So a couple of times here I've touched on the idea that something's not a solution, instead it was a workaround. Um, these are some general principles that I believe. You shouldn't need to work around a problem that can be solved instead of instead of working around it. It should be solved instead, especially for your users, so that your users don't have to work around it if you can solve it. And don't solve a problem that can be avoided. If you can design a language or, or system generally without a problem, rather than designing it with the problem and then solving that problem, you're a lot better off. Um, yeah, think of um, a good example if you're having trouble with that is object identity. That's a problem uh, in OO development, and a lot of developers have to go to a lot of effort to to solve that uh, as they add things like copy and deep copy to their objects, and um, and you know that may be a workaround. It probably is um, rather than a solution, but a pure language doesn't have that problem. The problem has been avoided. Um, and uh, I think that's a useful thing to think about. So I touched on uh, linear types. Um, so uh, that's that's one alternative to having monads. Um, and the clean language and the mercury language uh, both, both use linear types. Um, in mercury it's called uh, linear modes, uh, but it's it's roughly the same thing. Uh, as I understand it. Um, so, but monads are good, so maybe they should be available in your program anyway, just not required to write Hello World. Uh, the fact that they're required so early in a Haskell user's journey is, is part of the problem. There's another thing for managing state that maybe, that I think is yet to be proven. Um, or two other things, rather. There's effect typing, which looks very, very complex. Um, I don't know the details, um, but um, there's a smart bloke uh, called Ben Litmeyer who's been working on that. Um, and there's um, the idea that a colleague of mine had, uh, Peter, Peter Shakti, uh, had the idea of resources. And uh, I believe, I don't know if Lee Nash is using that independently, but I've borrowed that idea for a language that I'm working on. Um, as well, which should be simpler. Um, so, on to lazy evaluation. I think it's um, sometimes the elephant in the room because the problems with lazy evaluation don't often come up uh, until later in your Haskell journey and then they really hit you hard. So yeah, so it's, it's often uh, not a problem until it's a big problem. Um, and I don't think it gets a lot of attention in that way. In the next three slides, we'll look at an example of something that ought to be really simple, uh, uh, folding some uh, accumulator over a list. And these are, this is accomplished by fold R, fold L, and fold L prime. Fold R folds from the right, fold L for, uh, folds from the left, and fold L prime also folds from the left. And um, what we'll see is that in a strict language, it's very easy to know which of these is going to perform better. And in a lazy language, um, it can be a lot more complex. So we'll start with fold R. Um, in a strict language, uh, this is not tail recursive. The call to fold R, the, the recursive call, uh, has to occur before the call to the higher order function f. And um, and yeah, which is which is how we know that it's not tail recursive. Uh, this uh, creates uh, obviously uh, more stack space, uh, and and in addition to that, it causes the computation to iterate over the data twice. Once when iterating over the list, building up those stack frames, and then a second time as it recurses back through the stack, performing the computation. So it's it, it's also not ideal for data locality. In a um, in has in a lazy language, if if uh, this uh, computation is lazy, uh, f in particular is lazy, then uh, this can perform a lot better because the recursive call to fold r is represented by a thunk, uh, which means that it's not evaluated. Um, 
and so this is this does use a, a constant stack space. In fact, the call will usually complete very quickly. It'll, it'll complete in, in the time that it takes to execute the first F, uh, which may, may uh, depend upon the ex execution of other thunks. But the problem is that in Haskell, F might not always be lazy. I mean, when it is, it doesn't evaluate that second thing, and when it's not, um, it will evaluate that that second thing and behave as it would in a uh, in a strict language and so the problem is uh, not that it's uh, fast or slow but that it depends uh, the performance of fold r and and any of the others depend upon whether the data is uh, the higher order value is strict or lazy and you can't see that by looking at the code straight like this so you it's, it's not something that's made clear in the language. So now we'll look at fold L. In a strict language, it's easy to see that fold L is tail recursive. The, rec the call to F is completed before the recursive call to fold L, and the result of fold L is, is returned straight as the result of the, uh, of the second clause. This means that um, the, it, it, from this uh, we know from our knowledge of functional programming that this is definitely tail recursive. Um, in Haskell it's still tail recursive, but the problem is that each of the uh, calls to f uh, will be represented by a thunk, and um, and therefore it, uh, it builds a long chain of thunks in memory all pointing to one another and returns that. So now this creates some um, uh, space leak in when when it's lazy and again the problem is that by when you're looking at your Haskell code it's hard to determine whether something is strict or lazy so fold L prime is is aimed to try and solve this for fold L um, it uses the sec function to force the evaluation of the of the higher order call uh, before returning uh, before um, yeah uh, executing fold L. So this um, only when, but this is only, only performs well when F is completely strict. So um, the problem here in general is that uh, when you're, when you're using a strict language it's easy to, d to determine which of these is best. Uh, it's fold L. Um, when you want to use the others is when you have uh, a right associative operator. R um, if your associativity doesn't matter, then fold L is the best. In a um, in a lazy language, when your when your operator is associative, it can be it can still be difficult to choose which uh, function is the best here, uh, because. Um, because it depends upon whether the higher order value and the context in which this is being called are lazy or not. And um, well, if you think this is difficult for a seasoned Haskell developer, it's going to be Im impossible for a novice. Generally speaking, lazy evaluation makes it difficult to reason about performance. Um, and um, the, the case study here uh, for lazy evaluation and its problems is the Darks project, which was uh, uh, had a problem for a long time, and it might not, I don't think it's been fixed as far as I know, um, with lazy evaluation slowing down performance. Some operations were very fast, but others were very slow, and it was very difficult to predict which things you asked Darks to do. Um, Darks was version management software. Um, would um, would cause uh, pr problems or not? Um, otherwise, very innovative software. Uh, I liked the idea of it, but uh, yeah, but um, it was killed basically by lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation also interacts poorly with parallelism. Uh, to introduce parallelism at a basic level in a Haskell program, the par function is used. Now this function takes two arguments and it returns the second argument while uh, creating a spark for the first argument. A spark is um, it's a runtime structure, it's basically like a closure and it can be evaluated in parallel by the runtime system. It isn't necessary evalu necessarily evaluated in parallel, 
but it can be, and, and whether or not it is is up to the runtime system. Now, a Spark is only evaluated uh, to weak head normal form, and that means it's evaluated until the first constructor symbol is available, uh, not to normal form, which is where the whole structure has been completely evaluated and there are no thunks left. So um, the, the problem with uh, lazy evaluation and parallelism is that the first argument is only partly evaluated by the function par and so it's um it doesn't actually generate that much parallel work uh, not as much as you might be expecting so further work um, was added to Haskell uh, firstly in the form of psec which is a, a function that forces the evaluation to the first argument before are returning the second argument and this um, this can be used within your program and usually you put it within uh, the computation which is the first argument to par to force the evaluation of parts of that structure in order to provide enough parallelism but that means putting uh, calls to psec throughout some code in order just to get a little foot for a single call to par and um, and, and that's not ideal. It means annotating a lot of code uh, with this kind of function. So to help work around that, and I think this is a very uh, a very cool uh, idea, the, um, and I'll get to why it's cool, um, something called parallel strategies were introduced. Now this allows you to take an existing computation represented just by, because a, a computation is basically a data value in Haskell because that can be a thunk and um, and uh, taking um, and running parts of that in parallel so uh, so the reason why uh, this is very cool is that not only does it solve the the problem with needing to annotate your code with calls to psec it also provides a handy set of ways that you can parallelize code. For example, it's it's very easy to use uh, parallel strategies to chunk uh, the parallel evaluation of a list in order to improve granularity. Um, so, but um, but it's still uh, it's while it's a good idea. There's there's other alternatives as well. Um, and my my intuition, not that I've used either of these is that um, you use uh, parallel strategies or, or this one, DeepSec, uh, in different situations where, where each is more suitable. So DeepSec came along later and will the DeepSec function will take its first argument and completely evaluate it to normal form um, and then return its second argument. And then rather than annotating the first argument with calls to psec or using strategies, it requires that the first argument implement the nfdata type class. Then, um, then anything uh, with this type class, like this, this type class provides methods for, for fully evaluating uh, any structures, uh, for deeply evaluating them. Um, and, and so it's... Uh, it's guaranteed to completely evaluate that thing. So provided that everything has a correct implementation of the type class. Um, but this means, this also has uh, problems. You now need to um, add this type class to any, uh, any uh, data types that you might be using like this. But you might import a data type from another developer's library that doesn't already that doesn't have this type class, and you might be using it in in your own DeepSec type, and therefore be required that it imp also implements DeepSec. And that's uh, adding that type class instance to your module when you're importing somebody else's type uh, is uh, is uh, not uh, not great in Haskell because, uh, well, firstly, GHC will warn you about it uh, because it can create a situation where there are multiple type class instances for a single type and type class, and uh, that creates an ambiguity.
So to to summarize laziness, um, we saw with the examples with folding over a list that you need to know whether computations are lazy or strict in order to choose the best algorithm. Um, and um, and so firstly, you, that means understanding which one is better in different situations. And ideally, that's not by rote. I mean, many people learn that by rote, but ideally it means uh, understanding why so that you can make that decision uh, for, for other algorithms in the future. It also requires knowing whether something is strict or lazy, which is not something that Haskell uh, shows you easily. So, um, so, and both of those things are huge problems for beginners to the language. So, uh, as as well as experienced developers, it's um, it's generally difficult to reason about performance when laziness is involved, um, and we've seen experts struggle with that uh, in the example of the Darks project. Um, parallelism and laziness interact poorly as, I just show, as I've just shown. Um, so you need these extra things, strategies in DeepSec in order to attempt to solve that problem. Whereas those are simply not required. They're problems that can be avoided rather than solved in a strict language. Um, and a couple of things that I didn't touch on is that, at least for a long time, stack traces weren't available for lazy computations. I believe that may have been fixed in more recent versions of GHC, but I've not checked. And uh, lazy I.O. can also cause some surprises. Um, but I don't understand that fully enough to explain it. So. We could, of course, have a strict by default language, or, or just a strict language, uh, but opt-in laziness is also an option, and I think that's an option. Um, uh, I, I think that would be good, and and maybe it's uh, there are strict languages that provide laziness as a library function, but maybe if we have the compiler uh, do a bit more work there, um, it could be made easier to use because it requires um, some annotations. Although those annotations are very good because they show you clearly what's lazy and what's strict, which is part of, uh, which is a, a very big deal. And that's the end of the presentation. And uh, thanks for watching. Bye.